Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Female Male Perspective with my co-host, Eddie Cunningham, and I'm Tina Valiant. And we took a little bit of a break, and we're actually going to talk about that today a little bit. Um, we're going to discuss self-care and self-management today. And is it selfish? Because that's a big myth out there that everybody thinks, well, if I'm taking care of myself, isn't that selfish? I'm, I'm saying yes to everybody because I don't want to be selfish. So, Eddie, welcome. Hey, Hi, welcome you. back. Appreciate it. Yeah, I had a nice little trip that I took. I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I was just hitting a point of, of feeling burnt out. I wasn't hitting full burnout yet, but I recognized it coming and uh, I needed to do something about it. Uh, luckily, my cousin was like, hey, just go do what you got to do. And I'd always had a bucket list item of riding my motorcycle down the entire coast of California on the, on the uh, PCH. So I just got up, basically threw a bunch of clothes together the night before, and I jumped on the motorcycle. And first day I rode from Phoenix to Sacramento, uh, which was a really long ride. It was 11 hours on the bike, um, but it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, and then I next days were all about redwood and the coasts and I mean it was just it was very very cathartic uh but it was odd because you know I I had wanted to kind of just run away and I thought I would work on these things I would meditate I would contemplate I would you know okay what's coming up for me let me figure it out and then I'm just going to fix it on this trip and it really became more about it gave me more questions than I ever found answers on the trip. It ended up being about a, a, a 10 plus day trip total all the way down to San Diego. Um, but it gave me questions I didn't know I needed answers to. And that was kind of the important part of it. And we're really a lot about where all this came from. And I know all of us, especially that have been through a long-term relationship or a marriage and then ended it, could go through something very similar. Um, but it's kind of about redefining uh, your purpose. Mm -hmm. um, for me, since I was a kid, my dream, my vision about where I would be at this time in my life in my 40s would be uh, my kids moving out and I would be happily married and my wife and I would be working on us again and we would be building something together and you know, we would be very blessed and we'd have more time to spend doing the things we want to do and I'd start having grandkids and start to enjoy grandkids. And like, that was my dream. That's what I've worked for my entire life. Everything I've done has been about the family. Uh, for, even from when I was a kid, I was, was blessed, uh, even with trials that we all went through with, a, with everything being about family. And so that was my whole goal was family, 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 family. Uh, well, I ended up divorced. Uh, after being together uh, just under 18 years, uh, family split apart. And unfortunately, my uh, other half decided to try and make people choose sides. And it's hurt everything that we worked on and built a lot. And I, I still pray and hope for healing and, and for a coming together. But uh, in the meantime, I'm left without the family that I thought I would have right now. And you know, regardless of what that looks like in the future, it's not going to be what I had always envisioned and what I had always worked for. And again, I know this is a very common feeling for anyone who goes through a divorce. I'm sure even my ex-wife has felt the same thing. Um, it's just part of that pulling apart and the roots being ripped out from each other. <laughs> so everything I've done up to this point in my life has been about the family about really about other people with only moments where I've taken time for myself. Uh, but the problem is, is most of the time I took for myself growing up was about healing from traumas that were either done to me by others or I had committed, you know, to myself. Most of my self care was really about healing. It wasn't so much about growing. Now, when you go through healing you and you truly go through healing, you can't help but grow with it. But you know, when you get to a point where, I will put it this way, um, a person I know who I'm really close to went through an absolute hell in their life. And they've conquered some traumas that most people will never be able to fully comprehend and shouldn't have to comprehend that he had gone through. And at the end of it, 
um, he felt like his life should have been in another place. And I said, I said, I said, you know, the, the amount of work that you did could have, should have built you a skyscraper. You should have a massive skyscraper of a life right now. But the problem was because of the trauma that was done to you, you started off in a huge hole that was the size of a skyscraper. So all the work that you've done has just finally put you back on the ground on surface level. And it feels like you were robbed because I should have a skyscraper. I did the work. I did this much work. I should be up here, but you're back to, you, you've really canceled out a, a negative or a, or, a, or a deficit that you had in your life, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Um, and it, you can complain about it and say, it sucks. It's not fair, but you went through the work. You have strengths that no one else around you has. And you're going to do the work now. And now you're going to build something even more amazing than you would have if you hadn't had to dig yourself out of that hole. Uh, my whole life, everything's been around family. It's been around building the family, uh, raising kids, uh, trying to be the best husband that I could be, trying to be the best father. And I admit, I had my flaws, um, but I absolutely did my best. Uh, but now I'm left with me and only me. I'm here by myself. You know, I, I have I have friends. I have my cousin is my best friend who does uh, my businesses with me. Uh, I do podcasts. I do, you know, web series. I, I get out and I speak and whatnot. But uh, everything I'm doing really is for me now. And it's such an odd place to be in. It's such an odd place to sit in because like you had, like you had mentioned, most of us were raised that when you do something for yourself, you're being selfish. Right. You should do things for everyone else. Um, and that has been over the last you know, seven years, uh, one of the biggest mind shifts that I've had to make is no, it's okay to do things for myself. And it, it's funny because <laughs> actually I was having a conversation this morning with a friend about this, but when I first uh, separated uh, from my wife, I moved into this little condo and uh, man, I'll, I'll be real, even though people think I'm an incredibly strong person, I was kind of broken. And for four months, I didn't do jack nothing. I would go to shift. Uh, I was a firefighter then. I would go on shift for 48 hours. I'd come home for four days and I would binge watch everything. I went through the entire uh, what was like eight seasons of Dexter in like two weeks. I mean, that's <laughs> all I did. I got, I got chubby. I mean, I just, I didn't do anything. I was, I'll admit, I was a little bit depressed, but I did that for about four months which is totally unlike me because I've always been such a hard worker. But what I did, and this is something for everyone out there to just try this. If you're kind of in that funk and you just can't figure out a way out and you just want to get out of your shell, I downloaded Groupon. And I started doing every crazy, weird, odd, silly thing <laughs> that I had never done before from glass blowing to learning to paint, to working with clay, to painting ceramics, a little mom and pop restaurant that opened up in Cottonwood that, you know, was trying to get their name out there. Like I just went and did silly things that got me out of my comfort zone, got me out kind of socializing and did stuff for me, you know, and, and almost all of it were things that I had at once, but wow, that'd be fun to try. And I just never got around to doing. Right. Uh, so that's some advice for anyone that's kind of in a funk and you're just like, ah, what do I do? You know, I, uh, I don't want to go out and date. I don't want to go to these singles things. I don't want to. Okay, fine. Just do Groupon and date yourself. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most unselfish things that someone had told me. I, I, I couldn't believe I was doing it, but they actually said, just go date yourself. Take yourself out. And I would, I'd, I'd go out for dinner and sometimes people would make it awkward. Like, oh, are you, are you here alone? It's like, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's like, you get you um what do you call it? the the matron or whatever when you walk in they're like you know how many just me really oh you just want to sit at the bar <laughs> yeah that's almost every time you would you like to sit at the bar uh which i didn't mind either um i like sitting at the table though i'm a i'm i'm a people observer i love watching people so i wouldn't mind sit, sit me at a table in the corner and i'll just watch the people i'll watch the couples the really old couple who's been married for 60 years or the people that are on their first date. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, so back to where we're at, it, it is such a mind shift for most of us to shift from taking care of and serving and building something with someone and for others to, it's just me. 
it's just me here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for me and I'm going to receive the benefits of just about everything that I do. And I have to be okay with that. If I'm going to be healthy about this, I've got to be okay with that. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm successful. I do pretty well. And again, I've had this conversation with others and it's like, I just, I just felt without purpose for so long because why am I doing this before it was for the family and for the kids and, and for college and for, you know, retirement and for spending time with, with my, my love once we are able to retire. And, you know, that's what it was all for, but none of that's here anymore. Right. So how do you make that shift? And it's, again, part of it is just getting out and doing it and practicing it and letting that become a habit to get rid of the habit of you're only here for others. Um, but that is a deep seated agreement and belief that a lot of people have and a lot of people struggle with, especially women. Uh, women who are the nurturers naturally, who who were, are beautifully perfect at at caring for others. It just comes so naturally to women that how when you get divorced or in, even just become an empty nester, it doesn't even have to be something like a divorce, but all the kids move out and suddenly what does a mom do when she doesn't have to be a mom? You know, how do you make that transition? And that's, it's a great topic for us to talk about today. It is. And, and that is a difficult transition. And let's talk about the societal boxes that I talk about for a minute. And that is that, you know, when you're dating somebody early on and you share all of your hopes and dreams and all the things that you want to accomplish in your life. And a lot of that is what attracts your significant other to you is because you have all these aspirations and goals and dreams and all of these things. I'm like, wow, like this is a person I need to be around. I want to spend more time with this person. And, they, and those are the things that attract us initially. Well, then what happens for whatever reason is the minute we get married and we sign that piece of paper, men go into this societal box of, okay, my real role has begun now. I am the husband. I will be a father. I need to be the provider, the protector, the one who helps and saves and is the hero of my family. And women put themselves into this box of, okay, my aspirations, my goals, my dreams don't matter anymore because from a young age, we've been taught our prince is going to come in on his horse. He's going to rescue us. He's going to take us back to his castle where we're going to leave our family and our friends and we're going to take care of our king and we're going to take care of his king. Thank and you, Disney. What was that? I said, thank you, Disney. Right? And that's every fairy tale that's out there that we're taught as children. And here's what happens. We, all of a sudden, on both sides, not just women, men do this too. We put all of our hopes, goals, and dreams aside. You, for instance, you were destined to be a country singer, a star, and you put all of that on the back burner and you don't regret that because we've talked about it, but you put all of that on the back burner, your hopes, dreams, and goals, because your family needed you to be their protector and their helper and the person who helped save them through the emotional turmoil that they were going through. Me. I put all of my hopes and dreams aside when I got married at 19 years old and stopped being me because I thought I was supposed to be the nurturer. I was supposed to be the one who took care of everybody. I was supposed to maintain the house and cook the dinners and do all of these things. And that carried over into every relationship that I've ever had to the point where I was training my significant others what to expect from me, that I would always be the one to do those things. All right, that's that's interesting. Can you? I want you to elaborate on that if you don't mind, because you we had talked a little bit about this. Um, elaborate on that. You were training others uh, to be. In yeah, the I had to take ownership of that. So, for I'll give you for instance, my my recent ex husband. <laughs> he, um, I trained him that I was going to cook him breakfast every day and, and make his lunch and make sure that he had everything in the refrigerator so he could eat six times a day and then cook dinner after a 14 hour day working in real estate. I was gonna be the one that cleaned the house. I was gonna be the one that did all the laundry. I was the one that was gonna do all of that because I felt that that was my role. He also grew up in a culture where that is the woman's role. And I'll never forget that his mom was visiting us once and he had a shirt that needed ironed and he started ironing it. And she was like, why are you not ironing the shirt? And I said, because I worked all day trying to figure out dinner. 
and still have work to do. That, that's why. And she didn't speak to me for the next three days that she was at my house. Wow. You know, because that was in her mind, the role that I had was to do all things to take care of my husband and my husband first and then my children. Sure. I felt like I was letting people down if I couldn't keep up. I wonder how many women out there, I mean, I would guess this is total guess percentage wise, but I would guess that most women out there, and I'm saying better than 90%, understand exactly what you're talking about, have experienced and felt the exact same thing. Right. And at the same time, I've often had men tell me, I feel like a paycheck to my family. I go out, I provide, my role is to protect and provide the home and do all of these things, even though we're in a two working income society, right? We still have that innate in us, the agreements that you talk about along the way when we were young, these are the agreements that we were taught that this is what marriage is supposed to be like. But yet the roles of families have changed where both parents need to work. There is usually childcare involved because we're not in an era in most situations where one or the other could stay home and take care of everything. So why is it that women are deemed as selfish being bad mothers and wives if they're working full time to help support the family and then come home and are still expected to do everything that they would be expected to do if they didn't work? Well, and I think most of that is is, sure. Maybe it was taught by their mother to them because that's Mm -hmm. where most women get their idea of a mother from is from their own mother uh, or a wife. But I think most of that feeling is put on them by themselves. Most of the men that I know that I've talked with, uh, yes, like you said, training, which is really establishing expectations, and you're both agreeing to them as to what your roles are. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that in a previous podcast, how most relationships end up becoming negotiations for who I think you should be and who you want to be until you finally reach that that middle ground. You both have responsibilities on agreeing to those and whatnot. But um, most men would not have a problem if they could be told lovingly um, to, hey, you need to do more of this. And rearranging those expectations, that's where you know communication is absolutely so important. Most men, at first, it becomes like a little bit of a shock because, hey, I'll be real, every one of us, male or female, if we've ever had the chance to be spoiled, it feels pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's kind of nice to be able to kick back and let someone else carry the weight for a while. That was one of the dangerous things about me uh, getting into the dating scene, you know, too soon. I thought I was ready. I started getting into it. One of the weirdest feelings that I've ever had in a relationship since my divorce is actually having a woman who wanted to take care of me. I've never had that in my marriage at all. It was never part of the marriage at all. She had her own ideas of what taking care of, of, of the family was, and it, it had nothing to do with me. And I didn't even really realize that I just, we just kind of, again, did the whole negotiating thing, established our expectations and I was left pretty devoid. Um, so the first time I had a girl that I was dating, uh, want to come over and like, Hey, I, let me jump in and help you clean the house. I see that you're, you know, just got behind on some things. It was just weird to me, uh, <laughs> or, or, Hey, you know what? Let me take care of this. You just relax. Mm-hmm. Like I felt weird. I was, I was cooking dinner and she was like, let me, let me finish. I want to do this for you. I want to do this for you. I was like, what you do? Mm -hmm. Um, And my family would blow you away because the women in my family, that's what we have all been taught from a young age. You get your husband's plate, you cook dinner. He should be sitting on the couch or hanging out, whatever, with a drink in his hand, feet up, and you're going to take care of everything. That'd be nice. (laughs) That's traditionally how my relationships have been. Yeah, and it, I it's, do everything. It, and again, I can't even say it's right or wrong because it's really about what are you happy with, what are you comfortable with, and what do you want to be happy with. Because if if that works, then then fine, it works. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, if it doesn't work, it's something you've got to sit down and discuss and and start start changing. Uh, most men I know would be more than happy to uh, change things up if need be. Um, okay. What? Let's hear. It. I hear what you're saying. Okay, 
But if their entire relationship, this is how it's been. And Especially then when they were raised sudden, that way and their wife was that way, like you were talking about with your ex, he was taught that by his mom and his dad. You stepped up and did the exact same thing. So he's like, yeah, this is totally normal. And then I changed things. I started saying no, which was really hard for me. And I, and I want to dive into that for a minute because I think this needs to get out there. Cool. For men listening to understand the women in their lives a little bit better. Okay. We as women, being that we've been taught all of these things, we feel like a failure if we have to ask for help. It means we failed. Really? Yes. So when women don't ask. I know men feel like that. See? Absolutely. If we have to ask for help as men, we're taught in this society that if you have to ask for help, you're not pulling your weight enough. You're not man enough. We have been taught as women that if we don't do those things, if we're, if we're not, you know, cooking dinner every night, taking care of our family, us doing the bath for the kids, all of those things, we're taught that we're failing. We're not living up to the expectation that's been put on us. So if we say, hey, is it okay if you do the dishes tonight? We're failing. We're not fulfilling our role. Therefore, our husbands will have no need for us later. So that's that's interesting because one of, <laughs> and I, I might get some flack for this, but one of the worst things that I've seen women do and I can't stand, and most men can't stand, is the hinting. Oh, yeah. So is that part of the reason why women drop hints is because they don't want to outright admit, hey, I need some help. And so they just drop hints until they, because I'll be real, even if someone's hinting to me, I'll ignore it. Right. Now, and I, I've had men tell me, I don't read between the lines. Just tell me what you need. Right. And then men get even more upset because men want to be helpful. This is something I had to learn in the last couple of years. Men want to be helpful. They want to be needed, but you don't ask them when they're watching the game. You don't ask them when they're ready to walk out the door and go on their motorcycle ride. You don't, like they're focused on what they're getting ready to do. And this is where that singularly focused versus spaghetti brain focused comes into play between men and women. <laughs> men wake up, they have uh -oh. their directive, right? When they get up, they're like, okay, no, I don't see the socks on the floor because I am focused on brushing my teeth, eating my breakfast and getting out the door to go provide for my family. I'm already That's thinking about work. Yep. Right. So, and then the woman is like, didn't you see the socks on the floor? I'm not your man. Well, so no, here, actually he didn't. He didn't this, see it. This is scientific fact right here. Okay. So I, I hate this whole idea of, uh, men and women are, are equal okay i think we all deserve equal rights blah blah, blah. i don't care who you are but well, we, we are, are different we have strengths and weaknesses that need to you know yes. work with each other one of the most beautiful strengths that women have that men do not it is an it's just not the way we are wired okay and it's one of the things that i wish i could learn this but it can't be because it's i i, I believe it's a literal physical thing in the way our brains are wired men can only deal with one thing at a time. Okay, so, but we're able to learn to switch back and forth between topics really quick. So it might seem like um, I'm paying attention to the conversation while I'm texting someone else. Okay, but the truth is I'm flipping back and forth between the text and what you're telling me, and I'm only capturing bits and pieces of both. Okay, women, on the other hand, can watch, can have the TV on in the background, be on the phone with a friend, uh, and be typing up an email, and they're able to do all of those at the same time without missing anything. Men can not. We can only stay singularly focused on one topic at a time. Again, we can switch back and forth, but whenever we do, we miss whatever we shut off over here, and we're only getting this. Does that make sense? Yes, and oh. I teach that to women. Women have spaghetti brain. Men have, it, it's like a waffle, okay? This is the quadrant I'm in, and then I'm going to move to this quadrant, and then I'm going to move to this quadrant. If you want a man's attention to talk about needing help, you need yeah. to say to him, listen, honey, I know you're busy right now. When would be a good time for us to discuss something? It's not bad. Yes. It's not bad. Yes. <laughs> Got to give the disclaimer, right? <laughs> But I just, I want to run something past you and I'm needing your help with something, but I want to make sure that you, you're able to focus on what I'm saying. Right. So if you put it on a computer screen and you have your whatever Chrome, Google Chrome up mm -hmm. as your browser, 
um, you have all these tabs open. Okay, guys will do the same thing. They'll have all these tabs open, but they're only able to pay attention to whatever tab is in front of them, whatever one they've clicked on. Women, on the other hand, you'd be able to open every tab on the screen and they'd be able to actually focus on all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope that makes sense. And you're absolutely right. And it's it's tough because um, especially those, those of us guys that have you know huge hearts and we want to be an active role in building our relationship, you, you hit it right on the head. You go to your man, grab his face. I'm telling you, grab his face, whatever you have to touch him and say, hey, babe, can I talk to you for a sec? Don't just start into what you want to say because there's going to be about the first 20 percent he's not even going to hear because he's still focusing on. And I've I've gotten to the point where I'm bluntly honest with people. When people do that to me, I'll be, hey, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I didn't hear a damn thing you just said. <laughs> like I. Uh, you're, you're either gonna have you need to wait just give me a sec let me finish this because right. I, I do have ADHD um, or at least they tried to diagnose me with it as a kid and I do I am all over the place I go and I, I switch through tabs so freaking fast all the time right. um, but I do need <laughs> you know so a woman thinks because she said something I did it I got it out I said it I said my piece you know he must have received it and he maybe got 10 percent of it and then women get mad at us guys because we're like, you did? You told me that? Oh, yeah. It was like, I'm in the middle of drafting an email or something, and I literally won't even pay attention to what she's saying. And it's it's not that I'm being rude. I can only focus on one thing at a time. And if I get sidetracked, I will lose my focus on this. Right. So to, to say that to your man, I love it. That was perfect. If you could go to your man and go, hey, baby, um, just so I don't forget, I want to let you know there's something I want to talk about later. And yes, please, please, please tell us. It's it's it's, it's not, not bad. Detail. It's not, it's not in it's nothing bad. I just want to sit down and bounce some ideas off you. Then we're gonna go. Oh, okay, cool. Otherwise, if you go, babe, uh, we need to talk later. And then you walk out of the room. I'm not gonna be able to concentrate I'm on be, anything. I'm gonna be like, damn it, what the hell did I do? Uh, right. I picked up my socks. I know I did that this morning. <laughs> um, right. We'll be, and we won't be able to concentrate. So yes, please be straight with us. Pull us up out of whatever we're doing if you need to, but <laughs> please be patient with us on that. It's well, and women need to understand that men want to help, but here's the problem. If we don't ask for help and we allow it to get to the point where we need to be saved, there's going to come a lecture with that. Yeah. Because it's like, why didn't you just come to me initially? It actually makes men feel bad when we don't tell them that we need help because then it makes them feel like they failed or why am I not approachable that like she couldn't come to me and tell me that she needed help? Like, what is it that I'm doing that made it to where she didn't come to me? Why is that? When men take it personal, when that happens and what they need to understand is it's not, it's not against you guys. It's because we are admitting failure if we're asking for help. So I think that is definitely something that women can work on and not, and guys too on both sides, but people need to work on not feeling like a failure because they're falling short of expectation. I talk about this a lot in seminars um, when most of us compare um, our daily routine or work or whatever to that perfect day where you wake up right before the alarm clock and you're full of energy and everything goes great and every email comes through perfectly and you're able to respond right away. Nothing, the coffee makes itself and the kids get themselves off to school and everything's perfect and you have this absolutely amazing day where everything falls into place. That only happens maybe half a dozen times in your lifetime that you have that perfect day where everything goes right. Yep. But we compare every day to that. And one of the most enlightening and freeing things you could do to yourself is learn to just always do your best and accept your best and accept that it's going to be different day to day. So when you have this conversation with your man, you're not saying, hey, baby, uh, I can't do the dishes ever again because I'm, I'm really, really, really busy. You're just saying, hey, right now I'm studying for these finals or I've got this huge project at work and whatnot. Could you please, you know, help me out for this week? Could you, you know, do a little more whatever it is that you really need help with in, in negotiating. Um, I know that was actually something that my ex and I did pretty decently. Um, and I was, you know, really quick to help her out because we were both going through uh, paramedic and nursing school at the same time. Uh, we were both working on our, our brand new careers because we moved from Nashville where we had great careers to Phoenix where we kind of had to start all over. 
Mm-hmm. And so it became a constant game of give and take. And that only was able to happen through communicating with each other. Hey, I'm not going to be able to do this today. Is there any way you could do it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on it. And mm-hmm. we would go back and forth. And that's, that's a healthy thing. That's something that we should do without judging ourselves and without judging the other person. Mm-hmm. Uh, able but to then, everything. and I have to interrupt you because then men, then women, well, I told you, and then they start nagging about it. And here's why. Women's thinking in spaghetti, it's because we were created to be nurturers. We were created to take care of everything, right? Like like the, the minute details. We're the helpers. We're the supporters. That that That's how we were innately built. Now, women, I know some of you are going to be mad at me for saying that, but that's the reality of it. That's why we think the way we think. Because if we have four children, we need to be able to understand where they are at all times. We need to be able to manage all of these different things. And that's why our brains are created that way. Whether you like it or not, it's the truth. But here's the thing, and this will help men understand us a little bit better too. And that is because we think in spaghetti from the moment we wake up in the morning, we see and know everything that needs to be done. It is a continuous to-do list that runs in our brain of, okay, I need to get up. I need to feed the kids breakfast. I need to make sure my husband has everything that he needs. Okay. And then I have to get ready for work. And then I need to drop off the kids at school. And this list is running in our head constantly. It never stops ever. And So then all of a sudden we're like, well, why don't they just see that I need help? Why don't they just innately know this? Can they tell I'm overloaded? And here's what happens. You get these women who are, and I've been this person. I openly admit it in the past. I've been this person until I took ownership of this. I was bitter. Women get bitter. All of a sudden you start hearing the little passive aggressive statements like, well, maybe if you would take out the trash occasionally or maybe if you would put your laundry away. Those statements right there, most men will go, I'm not going to do it. Right. (laughs) I'm going to make it annoying to leave as many pairs of socks on the floor as I can. It's (laughs) it's kind of a subconscious thing, but the more, again, I'm a very direct person. Most men are very direct. And if you just tell us direct without being a jerk about it, nine times out of 10, we're going to change. We're going to do, okay, babe, not, not a problem. I'll do that. Now but when you're when focused you on that, something else, aggressive. You, you can't, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you can't be focused on something else while they're telling you, because then they're like, I told you, I told you. And you're like, oh yeah, you did? <laughs> yeah, you're like, when? And I usually ask, whenever I've had that come up for me, I usually ask, typing up an email. I was like, oh, okay. Well, babe, you got to like stop me or, you know, say, hey, is now a good time? And I'll be like, give me just a minute. Let me finish this up. But mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the more I can't stand hints, uh, I'll be real. And maybe it's, it's a little bit childish of me, but when, a woman I'm in a relationship with is dropping hints. I ignore them completely. Partly because, like you said about training, I don't want her to think that that's how our relationship is going to operate. I will not tolerate the hints and go, oh, okay, she's hinting. Because then then my mind power has to constantly be on reading into everything she says and does and try to like interpret it. And like, no, just freaking tell me. I'm a dude. Trust me if you just came right out and say, hey, baby, could you please do me this favor? I know, you know, I know it's just socks on the floor to you, but it would mean a lot to me. That point forward, when I take my socks off, they're going right in the dirty clothes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If she says it like that, especially if she's loving about it. Mm-hmm. You know, but if she's catty about it, if she's snippy about it, or if she's, you know, dropping hints and she's a smart ass about it, it ain't happening. I'm okay, not. Gonna- so let's talk about a strategy for men in this with the women in their lives. Okay. Yeah. All right, men, if you have a woman in your life that is dropping hints and being passive aggressive and being sarcastic with you, number one, it means that she's feeling overwhelmed and she feels like a failure if she asks for help. So understanding that you can bridge that gap 
if there's a woman that's doing that, it means she's feeling bitter inside for the world that she has created because she will not ask for help. It's not that she doesn't want to, it's that she's afraid of admitting failure. So you knowing that and loving the women in your life, this is a very simple conversation for men to have. And that is this, sweetheart, you've been dropping these hints. I don't understand what they mean, but I love you. I care about you. And what this is telling me is that you need help. So tell me what you need help with. It doesn't make you a failure that you need help. I am here for you. I love you. We're partners. And I will tell you, my boyfriend has done that a few times to me. And it makes me stop and go, wow, okay, so he's realizing that I need help and I'm not articulating what I, I need. He wants to help me. It doesn't make me a failure. And I have a partner in this. And your head explodes as a female. You're like, oh, like, oh my gosh. Like I can actually communicate this and it doesn't make me bad. Yeah. And if you open up that conversation as the male figure, you're now giving her permission to tell you what she needs. Safely. Safely. Yeah. You just became the biggest hero on the planet earth to this woman because you recognized that she needed to talk about it and you brought it up. You know, and uh, to be real with you, I don't think a lot of women would know how to react to that. No. I've, I've, cause I've, I've had a couple relationships that they were big on the hints. That's what they were used to in their, in their marriage. And that's the way they operate. And, uh, one of them, it got so bad with me that, uh, I literally picked her up carried her in the bedroom, closed the door, threw her on the bed, climbed on top of her, put her hands above her head, kissed her really, really hard. And then she looked at me and I said, okay, now that I've snapped you out of it, let's talk. <laughs> like we got to talk. And she was like, she was like in such shock. She was, she was, she was really kind of picking a fight with me is what she was doing. And it was her way of trying to open the conversation was to pick a fight. So there'd be a breakdown and then we could talk about things. And I, kind of took all that away from her and said, okay, now look, we can talk. We don't have to fight. You don't have to argue. You don't have to be mad about this. You don't have to drop any more hints. Let's talk. And it took her a while. Like to be real, she was scared to actually open up. She was scared to even say anything uh, because she thought that what she was used to was you are a failure. You're, you know, you're a woman. This is your responsibility. This is what you're, you were taught. Um, she was used to every man in her life being, horrendously harsh and mean when she didn't live up to uh, what they expected from her. Yeah. And unfortunately, I will tell you that there is some very savvy people out there, both men and women, but I'm going to tell you from the female perspective, I have more and more women coming to me recently where men have caught on to the fact that women feel like a failure if they need help. And they're using it as a weapon against these women that I know. And like people that I love and that I really, really care about are experiencing this right now where because they need help, they're a failure. Because they weren't doing everything, they're a failure in their relationship. And not just one person. I mean, I've, I've had this come over the last two weeks. I've had to, this come to me from five different women. It goes, I'm going to be, it goes both ways. Um, right. They're unhealthy men and unhealthy women will absolutely use your own insecurities against you as weapons of control. Uh, it is the perfect tool of a narcissist. Anytime you're vulnerable with a narcissist and you give them a glimpse into insecurities or fears or, or shortcomings of that you have flaws that you have, they will use that as their tool to manipulate and control you. Um, the only way the only way to take that away from them is to fix and heal yourself so it's no longer an insecurity. Mm -hmm. I That's agree it. with you. So let's talk about self-care and self-management and what it needs. Because when you said you were going on your trip, I was all for it. You needed to decompress and take time for yourself and do something that was just for you, that you enjoyed and something to get off of your bucket list. That doesn't make you selfish. 
it doesn't. And I also, I mean, okay, the, the quick story behind this is my ex-husband was amazing at gaslighting and making me believe that everything was my fault. I was crazy. That was his big thing is you are crazy. You are crazy. As a matter of fact, a couple of times he was like, you know what? I'm not going to continue our relationship with you until you go get help. I'm like, okay. So I went to a counselor. <laughs> totally backfired on this man. <laughs> it was the beginning of the end because he sent me to a counselor. Because I'm sitting with my counselor and I'm explaining my day to day life. Okay. And I'm like, well, I get up in the morning, I take my husband to the gym and drop him off. I get home, I take a quick shower so that I can start his full breakfast of hash browns, sausage and eggs, because he's going to text me and tell me that he's done at the gym. My assistant's going to pick him up on the way here so that his breakfast can be done by the time he gets here. And he would text me and say, on my way home, start breakfast now. That's crazy. Or he would literally be in the bedroom and text me and say, cup of coffee. When we were staying at my parents' house, my dad saw this text come in and me get up and get a cup of coffee and go take it to him in the bedroom. And my dad looks at me one day and he's like, what the hell are you doing? Good he's for like, him. Cup of coffee. And I'm like, he's like, that's not your job. He can get up and get a cup of coffee. Like, You're right. He, he, he can. So I stopped doing that. Right. And my dad started making fun of him every time text came in. Oh, is that your coffee request? Is that your coffee order? Like my dad was mad about it. Right. So me, my next part of my day was, okay, my assistant and I are going to get in the car. We're going to go do real estate. I have this showing today. I have this team member I need to meet with. I have this going on. I have this plan. I need to call back. I have the, these emails I need to send. What can my assistant do? What can I do? And then I need to make sure that I'm home by seven because I need to make dinner and make sure that there's enough leftovers for the next, for the other four meals he's going to need to eat tomorrow. And this was my day, like every day. It didn't matter if I got home at six o'clock. It didn't matter if I got home at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. There was a day that my assistant and I, there were several that I was out for 14 hours. I never ate. My assistant would chase me around with snacks to try to force me to get substance into my body because I did not have time. And she had timers on the phone to make sure that I got something into my body and here's your water and here's this and here's that. So I'd get home at 10 o'clock. Both of the men at home, because there was a older son, were sitting in the living room, hanging out, watching TV, playing games, whatever. And I'm like, did you guys eat? Nope. What are you making for dinner? And that was my day, like every day. But the way you, you handled it, like you said, the beginning of the end was you started counseling and you started fixing you. So what the counselor said was, I need you to write all of this down. And this is actually um, an exercise that I write about in my book, Finding Your Voice, because this was a big thing for me. It was part of my healing and owning my own crap. Because here's the thing, I created those expectations. I need to take ownership of it. I'm the one that said yes from the beginning and started doing it and it became expected, not appreciated. And that's what we do is we create these expectations by our, our current behaviors and everything that we do. And then all of a sudden, if we shift, now it's like there, there's a huge shift in the relationship. So the counselor said to me, all right, I need you to write everything in black on a calendar that you do for other people every day. I need you to write in pink or red everything you do for yourself. And this was really hard for me. I went home and I'm like writing everything down. And she's like, I need it next week so we can go over it. I'm like, okay. Every day I had an hour in the morning that was my time. So I had to get up at like 5 a.m. to have my hour of power before anybody else got up. And that was all that was on my calendar for me. That's it. Everything else was for everybody else. And she's like, okay, now I need you to start adding things every day for you. Eventually, I want more red or pink on this calendar than there is black. 
I'm like, but doesn't that make me selfish? She's like, no, because if you don't take care of yourself and keep yourself healthy physically and mentally and spiritually, you cannot be there for anybody else. Yep. So I started doing it. And she's like, now no is going to become part of your vocabulary. Like, like, like I need to say no to the, like to people like in general, because I was a yes girl. I said yes to everybody. If somebody needed something, it was yes. If he needed something, it was yes. I never said no to anybody. And she's like, yep, you're going to have to start saying no. And I want to know how many times you said no this next week. You need to keep track of it. I'm like, okay, this did not go over very well in my marriage. No, I bet. It was the beginning of the end. Um, like literally the, like we already had kind of a beginning to the end, but this is what catapulted it to the end. And that was, I started saying, no, no, I'm not driving you to the gym at 6 a.m. Ride your bike. He couldn't drive, by the way. And no, I don't have time to make you breakfast today. You know how to cook. You know where it is. You're going to have to do it. I, I have a meeting. I have this. I have that. I can't. And no, I'm ordering dinner. I'm not cooking dinner at 10 o'clock at night. I already ordered Uber Eats. It'll be there in half an hour. Please save mine for me. Well, that was nice of you. Well, he couldn't drive. So it's not like he could go, go pick something up. So whatever. <laughs> there's a will, there's a way. There, exactly. So I, you know, I always still made sure that they were taken care of, but I started saying no. Wow. <laughs> Was that not easy, number one? But number two, it was also one of the most freeing exercises I've ever done in my life. The power of no. Yeah. And I started planning things for myself. I would get a massage. I hired a housekeeper to come and clean the house every week. So you you still didn't put it back on him. Oh, it would never, never have gotten done. Yeah. Ever. I could not count on that for anything. But to me, what was important to me is that my home was clean for me. Sure. So I hired a housekeeper. Man, did I get flack for that. That came out of the allowance, right? Like, you know, his $3,000 a month. He was like, how are we going to afford a housekeeper? <laughs> We're going to make it happen because it's important to me. So I did. I started doing things for me. And it was amazing how much better I did overall in everything else in my life yep. because I was more clear. I was more, that's how I wrote two books. That's how I built a team because I started taking ownership of me while still loving and caring for other people. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing is, is just because you're giving to yourself doesn't mean here, here is where the idea of abundance and scarcity has to give way completely to abundance because we were taught and we've been taught because even though we're infinite beings, we're taught that we're finite because we live in a finite place of earth that has sun, sunsets and sunrises. Um, you don't have to take from others to give to others. Love is infinite. Um, the only thing that is finite really is, is time. Uh, and even that truly is infinite, but again, that's a whole other topic. Um, you don't have to take from others in order to give to yourself. When you're successful in business, it's not because you're taking from other businesses. There's enough success, enough wealth, enough everything for everyone to have everything that they truly want. But too many people live in scarcity where they think if I give to myself, that means I have to take from my family. Mm -hmm. If I love this person too much, that means I'm not going to be able to love this person enough. If I give too much love to myself, that means I won't love others as well as I'm supposed to. And it's just absolutely not true. The law of abundance is a gospel truth. It's a universal truth. It is there. There is more than enough, especially love. Love is exponential. When you give love away, your ability to love is doubled. So you give a factor of 10 away, you're going to have a factor of 30 to give away next time. Like it's, it's, it's infinite. And the more you learn to love yourself, the more you allow yourself to have the abundance to give to others. 
like you said, too many people are so busy loving others and serving others that they deplete themselves to the point that they stop even being able to give quality uh, to anyone else in their life. Mm -hmm. When you turn around and focus inward on the love and happiness that comes from within you, you will have an abundance to give to anyone that comes in your life. That still doesn't mean that you, you, you have to say yes all the time. Even if you have it to give, you can say no. Um, because you start when you start to practice and live and master self-love, you realize the value of it. And you don't just cast your pearl, pearls before swine. You actually choose who you give it to because you want them to take it and also multiply it themselves. Um, so many times in our lives, we just uh, give things away. So a great example with my restaurant. Um, I probably receive at the restaurant three or four requests a day for free food, for discounts, for uh, donations, sponsorships. Uh, I mean, you name it. I, I, I financially cannot say yes to all of them. Right. Um, and it's weird though, because um, I'll give an example. We had a school that had asked us to help feed their athletes and we fed them once and it was a great cost to us. It was actually like 70 sandwiches we were putting out a, at a game. Um, they asked us for it a couple more times and they said, hey, we'll put up a banner and we'll do a bunch of things for you guys. And we're like, you know what? Let's try it as a marketing thing. We'll, we'll do that. We'll give free subs every time you guys have a home game. Um, it was a horrible investment. It was not good whatsoever. We lost so much money, thousands of dollars on that. It just wasn't good. Um, next school season rolls around. They placed an order with us for the 70 free subs. Like they didn't even ask. They just straight up called and placed an order. And then when the cashier was like, you know, how would you like to pay for that? They're like, oh, it's free. And she was like, excuse me? Like who, you know, I, I didn't know, no one told me about this. You know, let me talk to my manager. And then obviously that was me. And I was like, no, they never called and asked us for it again. And the lady was angry at me. She ended up bad mouthing me to a whole bunch of people in the community saying that I, you know, had, had promised these things and, and I hadn't, I hadn't, I had given them and fulfilled my promise from the time before, but we build these expectations and I didn't feel guilty at all saying no to her from that point forward. Like there's, yeah. she's called several times and I just absolutely, I can't because I can't give to someone who's going to take that and turn around and it's going to be an automatic expectation and they have, they, they value it at zero. There's zero value in what you're doing for them and with them at that point. Um, and you have to value yourself enough to say, no, I'm not going to take what I have built and worked so hard to heal and, and grow and just give it to everybody out there. Mm -hmm. um, I only give myself away to people that are truly going to take it and turn around and do more uh, with it. Sure. Absolutely. And, and I, it, it will end really I had to learn how to set boundaries for myself because if I wasn't doing that and I was saying yes to everybody, whether it be my team, my kids, the man in my life, my family, whatever, strangers, didn't matter. Like whatever it was, I had to learn to start saying no, even though I wanted to say yes, because there was no way physically for me to be able to honor everything that I had said yes to. Right. And I was tired. I was worn out because I wasn't doing anything for myself to rejuvenate that energy within me. And all the people in your life that were feeding off you, none of them were recharging you either. No, no. At that time, no. Yeah. And that was a really big thing. Um, I can definitely tell those of you out there that being in a relationship with somebody that recognizes when you are tired and recognizes when you need help, even if you didn't ask for it and puts your needs above theirs as far as, no, I think you should take tomorrow off because you're tired and you need to rest or you're going to get sick. Yep. You know, that that's a big deal. Like they, they, when you're in a healthy relationship, your partner sees those things and reaches out and talks to you about it. You don't have to be passive aggressive. You don't have to say these little stupid hints. You need to be able to communicate. And there was a time last month where it was really, really, really difficult for me to do this. 
but I had a talk with myself and I'm like, self, I, you have to articulate what you need because it's not fair to expect other people to be mind readers. It's not Did you say that for all the other women out there. Yes, women. It is yeah. not fair for you to expect everybody <laughs> in life to be mind readers. You actually have to uh, use your words. Hints don't work. Guys can't read minds. Yep. Um, even though we're incredibly intelligent, we're a lot more simple than you give us credit for sometimes. <laughs> Just lay it straight. Just tell us what it is and we're, we'll surprise you. We'll step up a hell of a lot more than you think we would. <laughs> well, and I'm going to go on to another point with that too in a minute, but I actually was the person last month that was like, okay, babe, I am feeling really overwhelmed right now. It's not your fault that I'm feeling overwhelmed, but I need to articulate. I feel like I've been a little short recently, you know, a little short tempered for short fused, whatever, snappy. It has nothing to do with you, but I feel like I'm very overwhelmed with trying to keep up with everything and Orlando coming up and all of this different stuff. And, and I need more help. And that's hard for me to say, but I need more help. And guess what? I've made dinner like twice since then <laughs> because he wants to help. He, he's like, well, th thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me what's going on. He was so appreciative that I actually used my words to articulate what I was going through because otherwise it's, it's not his fault if he doesn't pick up on it. Yep. He's focused good. on other things. So, and I do want to say something else to women out there. And that is this, when you have your moment of time that you're talking to the man in your life, let them answer the question in their time. Here's why I say that. And, and Ed is smiling big right now. Here's women. We think 50 million miles a minute. Okay. And we're like, so I really need help with this. Do you think that you could help me tomorrow at such and such time? A man is going to go into his mind. He's going to calculate everything that's going on tomorrow. He's going to be pondering his answer because he wants to give you the answer that's accurate. And because you're tired and you have 50 million other things going on in your mind and you're tired of waiting, you're like, it's really simple. Like, all I need is for you to help me at this time tomorrow. Is that possible? Well, now you've changed the question. Yep. And now they're going to have to go back into their brain and recalculate their answer a lot of times. And I'm doing something simple with this question, but a lot of times women have this really long question. And men have to like, like put it into their compartments before they answer to make sure they've got it covered. And women are like, no, I need an answer now. And so they redirect oh. the question. And one, one of the best things that you're saying is, is uh, and this is so true about us guys and we have to do it with you women, is you guys won't even just ask one question. You'll ask five questions in one, in one long sentence and we're going, Okay, which, which one do you want me to answer first and which one do you want to work on first? Because I mean, is this a yes or no answer, you know, like, and, and seriously, like, and it's, or the worst, this, this, this is the worst. This makes me not want to answer the question at all is when a woman will ask you a question and then when you don't answer fast enough, they give you the options. Oh, yeah. And then you've is got it, to think about the this, options. Is this and I'm going, no, it's none of those things. Like but just, then they don't even give you time to answer again. Right. Then they redirect again and throw something else at you, right? Or like, you just don't care or blah, blah, blah. And then they like, and then you look at them and you're like, you know what? Forget it. I'm not even answering. Men get frustrated at that point. Oh, that's true. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll be like, I'm, I'm not even going to have this conversation with you right now. Like I'm, cause I don't like fighting. I'm not going to argue with you. Um, when you're ready to actually let me know what it is you need an answer to, well, let me know. But yeah, don't, don't ask me a question and then give me what my options are. Let me actually have my own mind and let me, let me speak it. Um, it's actually kind of like an insult for you to tell me that you, you have all the answers already and I need to just pick one. It's emasculating uh, to a lot of uh, men. It's, it's kind of laughable. Yeah, I don't know what, I don't know too many men that would let that emasculate them. If not, they're still boys. They're not men yet. But um, yeah, and, and again, give us time to answer. Don't give us a bunch of options and don't give us five questions in one sentence. Like 
like, let's have a discussion about this. <laughs> don't, don't ask me five questions in one sentence and expect me to go back and answer every single one of them in the exact order that you wanted them answered and in the exact way that you wanted them answered. If you have an outcome that you already want, don't ask a question and then get mad when you don't get the answer you want. If you didn't tell us what the answer was that you wanted, don't get mad at us if we don't give you the answer that you wanted. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And, and that is something that men do not know that we need time as women to do something for our, ourselves to deflate or whatever if we don't actually articulate that. If a man asks you, well, why do you get up so early? Like, why do you do that? Like, wouldn't it be better if you just slept? Because that's how most men think. And if you don't give the explanation, it's not that they're coming down on you. It's not that they're trying to change how you're doing things. Women take it as a criticism, okay? Like, because that's what I do. Like, that's what I want to do. And they get all snappy about it, right? Men are like, no, I'm just trying to understand your methodology here. Because I would think you would want to sleep longer, my answer to that question would be because I need my time in the morning to formulate my thoughts where nobody is texting me or calling me. I'm not checking emails. It's my time to myself to let my brain process all the spaghetti in it. Once you give that answer, it's done. It's over. They just want to know. They're curious. Yes. So stop taking it so damn personally. Women, they just want to know. I love it when because the four agreements. I love it when the four agreements pop up. Don't take things personally. Always do your best. <laughs> don't make assumptions. <laughs> and don't don't make assumptions. We women do not know what they're thinking. Uh, Stop trying to analyze what they're thinking and creating all these stories in your head. And at the end of the day, stop treating men like hairy women. Okay, they do not do five different topics in fifteen minutes. You stick to one topic, and then when that one's done, you move to the next one. Because they're not hairy women. Start treating them like men. They think well, now, and process differently. Now we now we can do multiple topics. We can. We just can't do them like at the exact same time. Uh, and we can rarity, do, Ed. We can do them really quick. We just need. Yeah. You're a rarity, though. I, don't, I, I don't, can talk to you for hours and we can talk about 10 different topics. Okay, like no problem. And we can bounce. Oh, wait, can we go back to that one topic before? Because when we were talking about this, that hits with that topic too. And you and I can do this whole circle thing. You're like in the 5% out there. I don't, I don't think so. I think maybe, <laughs> maybe I've got a little different experience in life when it comes to relationships and I've just learned a little more. And I've studied a little more, but I really genuinely believe almost all men on the planet are capable of, of doing these things. Uh, I think a lot of it, like you said, has to do with, with the culture of the way we've raised men and the way we've raised women. Mm -hmm. um, I just think people, is, a lot of men just haven't realized what they fully are capable of. And when I, when I talked earlier again about how women can multitask multiple things at the same time and men can't, neither of those are better than the other one. Right. And actually the, some of, they are better than the other one in different situations. And I'll, I'll be real with you. One of the reasons why I'm absolutely against women in combat is because of the way a woman's mind and heart works compared to the way a man's mind and heart works. If I'm in combat and we're getting shot at, we're in the middle of something and my buddy's head gets, gets blown off. I'm gonna continue with the mission. I can set that aside. I can remain singularly tasked and then go back and deal with the emotions of that later. Women are just not geared for that. They can train themselves into it. They can work really hard at, at, at trying to be that way, but that's not the way they really are. Right. Um, and you could put that into business or whatnot. That's one of the reasons why, why men um, really excel in negotiations um, and that women have to train a little bit harder to really nail it. And again, this isn't a cut down on anyone. Right. This is just the way minds work and you have to learn to use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think most men just haven't learned what they're fully capable of and haven't had the chance and the void to step into it to be able to actually step up to it, if that makes sense. 
And again, as long as women are making up for it, guys don't have to. You know, I great segue. This uh, one of the biggest complaints I get from women is that there's just uh, the bar is so low that men don't strive for a higher bar to be a better man. And I ask that same woman, well, what kind of guys are you dating? It's always the same guy. It's, you know, this guy, and he always treats me like this. And it always just seems to be the same guy, even though it's a different guy each time. And it's like, well, it's because you're not raising your own bar. Mm -hmm. Why should a guy step up and raise? Now, there is an answer to this, but why should a guy step up and raise his bar when you've set the bar so low he doesn't have to? It's still get you. Now, me personally, I think a real man sets his own bar high and isn't, you know, just trying to get the bare minimum here. A real man is trying to excel in every area of his life for himself, for his own life, for his own uh, self-esteem and self-confidence. However, it is true. You know, I've, women just don't hold men to a higher standard. Women think, oh, you know, I'm so lonely. I might as well lower my standards that I'm not lonely anymore. And I've seen so many friends of mine that are female go through one bad relationship after another complaining about it. And yeah, you've got to raise the bar. And Maybe. not taking ownership of the world that they've created. Yep, we'll step up into it, I promise you. And not that it's your responsibility. I'm not saying it's women's job to fix us and, and do that. But if you raise the bar, you'll be really surprised at how many men step up to that bar. Yep, I agree. I agree. So we need to wrap up today, but let's let's just hit a couple of things before we wrap up today. Okay. And that is self-care and self-management is not selfish. You cannot take care of other people if you are not first taking care of yourself. If you're in a situation in your relationships where the same things keep happening over and over again, remember that the common denominator is you. So you have some role in that that you need to work on because you're attracting and creating the same scenario over and over again. And that's something that I had to take stock in myself and really look at myself and what I was creating in my life and how that was happening. And listen, that calendar that you guys have, if your calendar is full of things for other people in your life, it is time for you to start learning how to say no. You cannot physically or mentally be there for everybody else and not be there for yourself. So know your limits, accept your limits. It doesn't mean you're a failure. And this is for men and women because there's a lot of men out there and we, we have this whole topic we want to talk about at some point where you're trying to be the white knight and save the day. And you know what? At some point you have to step back and realize that you are human. You are not God. And it's okay for you to say no as well, men, even Absolutely. though you want to help and save. Absolutely. Anything you want to add to that, Ed, before we click off today? Um, no, just the, my final thought would be to recap that, it, again, too many people are working outside of themselves to fix things that need to be fixed on the inside. And I'm, I'm telling you, even from a business standpoint, um, if you work on the core of who you are, the rest of the life, the rest of your life, the rest of your relationships and everything will sort themselves out. As weird as that sounds, they will just uh, move around who you're becoming. Mm -hmm. uh, just to throw a quick analogy about that, my restaurant, um, we're required to spend when we first opened the restaurant, a lot of money on local retail marketing. I believed in my heart that if I focused on the core of the business, which was my employees, uh, especially my managers, but my employees, and I acted as a servant leader where I was there to serve them instead of sitting at the top barking orders down, that the customer service would be so amazing that the customers would be my marketing, my employees would be my marketing for me, that it would just be a consequence of focusing on quality uh, and, a, and a good experience of working at the restaurant that everything else would take care of itself. So I purposely didn't spend the money I was supposed to in the beginning uh, because I wanted to see what the fruits of that would be. And it's the same thing within us. And I quickly went from within five months, my restaurant went from being a brand new restaurant to being one of the top performing restaurants in the world. We were ranked number one and we were almost 30 percentage points higher than restaurant number two. And that was just in five months with zero marketing. Uh, we are still and have consistently for the last six years been one of the highest grossing restaurants uh, in the franchise. And it all came from focusing on the core first. 
and that works with you, that works in every one of your relationships. If you work on fixing your insecurities, your fears, the things that hold you back, practice and begin to master self-love, everything else in your life is going to start becoming true abundance instead of scarcity. Uh, and your relationships will all have the opportunity to adjust or to fade away. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. So everybody out there this week, practice some self-care, self-management, start to set healthy boundaries for yourself, learn how to say no and do it gracefully. And don't forget, ladies, if you want to have a conversation with your man in your life, don't try to talk to them when they're watching the game or invested in anything. Just say to them, babe, we need to talk later. It's not bad. I just want to go over some things with you that are going on in my head and when would be a good time and make sure that that's where their focus is when you actually sit down to talk to them. So everybody have a great week and we'll see you next time. All right, see you guys.